Welcome to Europe ECR 2017 here in Paris. My name is Dr. Ashok Seth from New Delhi, India, and with me here is Greg Stone from Colombia, New York, and Azim Latif from Milan, two of the greatest experts in BRS technology and BRS therapy at the moment. So Greg, great to have you here. Thank and you, let me start off by saying that uh, metallic drug eluting stents over the last 15 years have become so much better. Tain strut, great devices. Do you really think that we need BVS or a BRS technology at the moment? Well, I do because metallic DES have gotten very good within the first year. But once the restenotic process is mostly over, having the permanent stent there long term is actually only a recipe for trouble. You can get late strut fractures, late neoatherosclerosis, and you get an ongoing risk of events because the stent is there for the life of the patient. So I think we need a device that removes that very late risk. And disappears from the body, okay. But the data doesn't look so good. Absorb 2 was a disappointment, and I really expected Absorb 3, the pivotal yeah. largest randomized trial in the USA, to actually have a better two-year data. The yeah. first-year data looked good, yeah. but the two-year data wasn't so good. So what are your analysis of that data, Greg? Well, remember, first off, we're still in the active bioresorption phase. So the goal is not to be better within the first couple of years than Zions or other metallic DES. Hopefully be as good, then after three years, when the scaffold's gone, that's when the outcome should improve. Now, the way we implanted and the way everyone implanted Absorb in the early days was with what we've learned to be suboptimal technique. And as a result, the, the outcomes are not quite as good. They're a little bit worse, so one or two percent. But I think we can do better with better technique uh, with good scaffold implantation. Do you, do you think the scaffold thrombosis rates are higher with this device? Well, they are, as has been practiced with suboptimal technique. I mean, there have been seven randomized trials, more than 5,000 patients, and they've all shown a two or three-fold higher scaffold thrombosis rate than um, Zions, both before one year and after one year. But the data about technique, choosing the right vessel size and implanting them properly, suggests that that excess risk can be markedly reduced, if not eliminated. So did that analysis get done for Absorb uh, 2, and did that show yeah. that it was better with the, with the a better technique? So we've done an analysis within the Absorb randomized trials. Yes. And if you employ what it's become known as PSP, pre-dilatation, appropriate vessel sizing, and particularly eliminating very small vessels, and then routinely post-dilating with a non-compliant balloon at high pressure, especially with a slightly oversized balloon, then you can get target lesion failure and scaffold thrombosis rates similar to Zions. Azim, uh, you've had a lot of experience with the device. And this PSP technique, which Greg talked about, is something that you seem to apply. Now, are the registry, late registry data, most recent registry data, which tell us about all this, that it's actually the best way to do things? Does it alter outcomes? Does it alter outcomes in your own practice? Sure, absolutely, Ashok. You know, the registries, particularly in Europe, have taught us a lot about this device taught about, its, about its limita their limitations and how to overcome them. So, you know, if I look back in over these last few years, the two studies that are really worth mentioning are Ghost EU and the MIC at Four Cities uh, registry. Both those registries showed what the early experience was from real world use. And they showed that if operators use these, device, these devices in complex lesions without adequate technique, it was associated with poor outcomes. And we really saw this very well in the Four Cities Registry. At the minute you started using a dedicated, specific technique for implanting, implanting BVS, literally the curve rates just divided. You know, when you had a good technique, you could eliminate almost stent thrombosis or scaffold thrombosis rates and have rates that were very similar to metallic stents. I think a lot of data got presented here which exactly showed that in registry data. Absolutely. So what's your, what's, what, what are your results like? Right. Your well, you know, results? looking at the registry data here at Europe PCR, I've, I've been involved in some of those and what they show is a more modern, in modern technique for implantation. You know, to mention a few, today we saw it disappears. So large registry done in Italy in multivessel disease, long lesions with a scaffold thrombosis rate at one year in these complex lesions under 1%. We saw also the BVS STEMI registry, another Italian registry in STEMI, 500 patients at 30 days low scaffold thrombosis rate. And what it really does is reassure me about what I'm doing in my own lab. You know, in Milano we've been treating some very complex lesions. Uh, we've been treating lesions that 
probably wouldn't have gotten into the randomized studies, most of them. Which most so, of people won't even treat with metallic drug exists. Absolutely. Exist. Well done. But you know, we wanted to understand where the, these new devices would help our patients, which is a complex group of patients. Right. So in our patients, where we're implanting about 54 millimeters of scaffold per patient, okay, we've looked very carefully at our data. We started from the beginning exactly doing what Greg mentioned, so PSP, you know, good, proper pre-dilatation lesion preparation, sizing the scaffold to the vessel, so avoiding small vessels. I think we've really learned that. So while you're talking about sizing, do you believe that imaging, intravascular imaging is important, essential, should be performed in all or, or is optional? Yeah. So in, in, our, in our practice, you know, I'd have to, I have to practice what I preach, you know, preach what I practice, right? Uh, and in our practice, we use imaging in about almost 90% of cases. And Greg, yourself? Well, we have done that forever, even with metallic drug yes. stents. And I'm convinced that with every type of stent or scaffold technology, you'll get better results with intravascular imaging. To one, make sure either the stent or the scaffold is as large as possible. Use it at baseline to decide, one, what is appropriate sizing. Size to closer to the external elastic membrane rather than the lumen. Decide on preparation when you see unexpected calcium or severe fibrosis, etc. Make sure there's not untreated edge disease or untreated major dissections left. And, and I've got no doubt that you know for both BVS and metallic stents we get better results with imaging. Do a meticulous job. Do it well, meticulously ab and well. Absolutely. Uh, Azim, let me ask you: Have you? Do you believe that we should be having these patients on? longer DAPT, perhaps beyond one year? Do you support that? Is there any evidence for you to believe that? Well, you know, in my own practice, I'm treating some very complex patients uh, who have a lot of disease, who have a lot of stents or scaffolds. So in my practice, irrespective of whether I'm implanting stents or scaffolds, I tend to extend dual endoplatelet therapy, very much like we saw in the yes. DAPT study. Right. These are really complex patients. Yes, and, and, and anyway, DAPT scaffold, actually, the DAPT study showed us the fact that the ones who have low bleeding risk should anyway continue dual antiplatelet therapy for longer than one year for its benefits. So I think yeah. that's that's perhaps, Greg, that what you feel is a better, at, well, better we, we option Well, we don't have any patients. data yet Correct. for no. scaffolds. There's no randomized trials. Yes. And even the registry data don't really yet support prolonged apt. But you never know within registries why you stopped early. It may have been sicker patients or uh, physician choice because they're doing very well. You just don't know. So, But then would it cover the very late scaffold thrombosis that we are seeing? Well, you would think, we, we know that it is effective for metallic drug eluting stents. As long as they're not in excessive bleeding risk, they do reduce metallic DES yes. stent thrombosis. There's no reason to think it wouldn't be as or more effective with bioresorbable mm -hmm. scaffolds, especially in that active phase of bioresorption right. where you may end up with scaffold segments segments in the lumen as it dismantles itself. So at the moment I'd say it wouldn't be right to summarize that it's prudent to carry on with dual antiplatelet therapy in low bleeding risk patients to be on it. For year. three years I think yeah. is prudent. Right. Okay Greg, the, the real prospective data for the PSP I guess yeah. will come out of Absorb4. That's perhaps the largest and the only randomized right. trial which has actually used PSP prospectively. So what's the, I mean, is there any evidence yeah. of that, any, any evidence that you have that it may actually be working? Uh, I know the data is not yet out, but uh, sure. perhaps you can tell us something more about it. So Absorb 4 was the follow-on study to Absorb 3. It's an additional 2,600 randomized patients with even higher risk patients. Patients with troponin positive, non-STEMI, thrombotic lesions, up to three lesions treated. And we did take some of the learnings from Absorb 3 about technique and translated them to Absorb 4, specifically really training sites to avoid the very small vessels and at least encouraging post-dilatation. We didn't mandate it like I would have liked, but we encouraged it. What we know is, again, while you, as you say, we have not unblinded the data yet, we've gone from 19% of patients in Absorb 3 being enrolled with very small vessels to 4% in Absorb 4, and we're up to about 86% um, post-dilatation of the scaffold. And what that's been associated with looking at the pooled data is more than a 50 to a 60% reduction in both early and late stent and scaffold thrombosis. Now, I don't know if that's the Zion stent or the absorbed scaffold. Maybe they're both getting better. Maybe one is getting better more than the other. But overall, the rates are getting very, very low. low. Right. That, and that's, that's the good that's, news that's despite higher risk patients.
example. When are we going to see the first of that data, Greg? This is going yeah, to be so, exciting. So we modified the protocol, so the, the first primary endpoint is going to be in 30 days, and that's about you know 80% of all one-year uh, stent and scaffold thromboses occur within 30 okay, days. Sure. And so that will be either later in the summer or the fall of 2017. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So dear friends, uh, we've just discussed BVS, the nuances of uh, the data, uh, the, uh, the, the technique of implantation, and what we hold for the future for this very promising and exciting therapy for coronary artery disease. The crux of the matter, or summation of everything that we've discussed, is that technique does matter, is the right way to implant it, the PSP is important for its optimal implantation and getting the best outcomes from the device. But also equally important is the right selection of patients, the younger age group, the right sort, and coupled with imaging, perhaps gives us the best results for the moment with this device. I'm sure there are greater iterations, new devices, the future looks good, and we all hope and, and, and uh, uh, await the results of uh, the Absorb4 study. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.